our books, folders. And I would say, I got a, my dream of mine is to have a study Bible, so that will come in the future. And it will come sooner. Uh, I want, uh, I'm going to do a little review before we finish chapter 14, which is it's a preview of the Battle of Armageddon at the Valley of Megiddo. And then we'll get into chapter 15 about victory this evening. Um, first, I want you to, if you have this one, it's a, a rectangular black box, the timeline of the future events. Um, The reason why I like well I like both I like both charts, but this chart I really like because it's pretty simple to follow. And the point I wanted to really focus on and to make sure and I'm sure you all know out here you all know. I want everyone out there that is watching to know, those that follow us within service or Bible study, is that right now we are living in the age of the church. That's the, that, this is the age where the gospel must be preached to all nations, according to Matthew 24. Now once this word that has gone out is preached, the, great, the next greatest event that will happen is the rapture of the saints, the rapture of believers. That is very important. And why is that important? Because I want you to focus on what the Bible says will happen next in prophecy. The church age started now it says here in this black box from the day of Pentecost, I disagree with that because the church started when Jesus was on this earth and the church was initially started as an institution with his disciples because in, in the last chapter of Matthew, he gave the great commission to the church, not the disciples, but to the church. So the commission is an ongoing thing institutionally with his church, not just the disciples. So that would be the one thing I would change and I should have changed it last night. But the church age started when Jesus was on this earth, being the, the head of the church, the leader of the church, the foundation of the church, up to the day of the rapture. When will the rapture happen? We do not know the exact day or hour, but it is close. Now, I am going to say some things again. I don't apologize for what I said. I apologize that you're deceived those that are out there. A major speech was made this past week by Pope Francis, who is from the Jesuit order, which is the militant branch of the Catholic Church that has killed many people because they did not turn to Catholicism. The Spanish Inquisition is an example of that, where many, many people, women and children and men, were killed because they would not plead to the Catholic Church. He made some comments that were very distressing. Liberals, Socialists, communists, atheists, uh, agnostics praise this speech because it's heading in the right direction as far as being uniform, being one. What I disagree with is the whole religion of Catholicism because it's not scriptural. Now people will say, well, Pastor, who are you to decide that? I am no one. I'm just a peon. But I go by what the Bible says. And the Bible makes it very clear in the book of Matthew not to call any man father. Jesus himself said that. Now, well, I'll call my daddy father. That's relational. We're talking about spiritual authority. No man has the right to hear your sins, confess your sins, and forgive you. I am not a priest. Don't come confessing to me. I can't forgive your sins. Confess to him. He can't forgive your sins. He's the one that saves. I'm just a messenger. The church has no authority to dictate on any marriage. In other words, the church does not have the right or the authority to grant clemency to any birth or marriage. That's between you and God. God does have the authority to tell us how to live. God has the authority to tell us what to do. He is God. The Ten Commandments are exactly that. Commandments to us. This is God says, you could do this, but don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. God has that authority. God has the authority to judge. God has the authority to redeem. God is in control every second, every day, every hour. God has the authority to say His peace. God expects His children to follow His will. God expects His, uh, his people to follow His Son. 
God expects his people to follow his word, the Bible. God demands it and God expects it. Now, it doesn't matter if you're the Pope of the Catholic Church, your authority and your word is meaningless in the eyes of God. You do not have the authority to forgive sins. You do not have the authority to grant clemency. You have no authority whatsoever in the eyes of God. It is useless. It is vain. It is powerless. God does have the right and the authority to do what He wants, when He wants, and how He wants it. That is sovereignty. He is God. God does not have to accept homosexuality, and He doesn't. God doesn't have to accept abortion, and He doesn't. God can say that He is the only true living God because He is. This is reality. Your reality is uniform. Your reality is universal where anything and everything is accepted. But the reality of the situation is this. There's one door, Jesus. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's it. The reality of the situation, there's only one baptism. His baptism. Not sprinkling or pouring or church ordained. It's God ordained. There's one church. And it's not the Catholic Church. You got that, Cooter? The church is not Catholic. His church is blood-bought. His church is blood ordained. Jesus is the head of the church. He doesn't need help in, in, in controlling it. Jesus is the head of the church. It's His cross, His word, His blood. It's His church. The church that follows Him in spirit and truth is His church. The church that has a relationship as a bride of Christ to the groom, Christ, that's His church. Is that clear? Is that crystal clear? I'm not going out of my way to cause trouble. No. But I will say this. Crap is crap no matter if you put lipstick and a gown on it. It's still crap. You cannot take the things of God and you mess it up and call it godly. That is blasphemy. There is only one church. And this church is not the building. This church is not in statues. This church is not in doctrines or in traditions. This church is steeped in the Word of God with spirit-filled and spirit-led people. That is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Who are you, you little peon? I have more authority because God chose me. Did God choose you? I know it because everything in my life has been, God has had a hand in it. God chose these people. They're His children. You don't choose yourself. You don't appoint yourself. You don't, you don't have a Paul and say, you're in. That doesn't work that way. And when the church, when, 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 I'm going to tell the world this. You know, I really don't care what you think. And this is the truth. I don't care what you think. I'm telling you the truth. Do not listen to the Pope. Do not listen to the Muslim religion. Muhammad was a child molester. Write this down, Muslims. Red kids and girls. Why do you think when they go to heaven they have 17 virgins? That's their heaven. You know what? 17 virgins? Who, that's not in the Bible. 72. 72. Say what? 72? 72. One woman is enough. You don't need 72. It's all based on lust. It's all based on just plain old sinful fleshly lust. That's their heaven. Being surrounded by virgins. Waited on hand and foot. You talk about a sexist thing. You don't think that's sexist? They treat their women, they have to wear, they have to hide behind the veils and masks and walk behind them. Is that honoring to God? You think God made women to be treated that way? The, the point is this. There's only one truth. And that truth is like a needle in a haystack. It's like a pebble. It's like a pearl in the ocean. It's rare, it's unique, it's sovereign. But once you find it, you better hold on to it. Because that is the pearl of great price. That is the truth that Jesus gave us. No one has the guts to say that because they're scared, because they're they're being controlled by their church board and their church members what to say. They're worried about their reputation, how they will look. 
See, I have the luxury of not, <laughs> I don't have that. See, I have the luxury of not doing that. I don't have a TV show where the ratings are going to go down. So what if they go down? Or I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose millions of dollars. Kath, when was the last time we had a million dollars? That's so long ago, I don't remember. Like never? Never! But I do answer to one. And I answer to one. And he's the one I must answer to. And he sits at the right hand of God. And he is my boss, and he is my king. And if he was here, he would say the same thing. Either for him or you're against him. You either love him or you hate him. You either receive him or you reject him. That's it. So you people, if you want a real church, if you want a real truth, if you want reality, we're here. If you want to stay where you are, just tell them where you're going. It's just the truth. Rapture of the believers. First thing that will happen. What happens forward in the book of Revelation only happens to unbelievers. It only happens to those that are left behind. I want that make that very clear in the, because the, the Bible makes it very clear. If you are here and you're left behind, the only choice you have is to be martyred. Do not receive the mark of the beast. Do not receive the 666. If you do that, you're doomed. You're hell bound. There's nothing that will save you. I'm saying this first because, I don't know, you think it's a joke, you think it's funny. You, you, you think, oh, this is, not, this is this is some crazy loon out there in the woods saying, folks, I'm telling you right now, this is reality. It's coming, and it's here. The judgment seat of Christ will happen after the rapture of believers. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that this is not a judgment to see if we are in heaven. That's already been determined. This is the judgment on the rewards based on our commitment to Jesus Christ. How many rewards you receive, that's between you and Christ. We don't know, but He knows. The divine judgments to seal us the trumpets and the bowls will happen on earth. Now notice how it's broken down in the box, if you can read it. The abomination of desolation as described in the book of Daniel. It's broken in two parts. You have three and a half years of what? Deception. Then you have three and a half years of the Antichrist reign. Now let's, let's be very clear about something. Evil cannot hide forever. Evil will reveal itself in time. People cannot hide and mask who they are forever. Their fruit will eventually come forward in time. The Antichrist in these three and a half years of deception, and, I, and I, I don't mean to use the word in a derogatory way, but I think it sets the point, it gets the point across. This is three and a half years of dating between the Antichrist and the world. They build a relationship and they fall in love with each other because you have gullible unbelievers that believe that this is really really the answer to all their problems. And they build a relationship in three and a half years of deceit and deception. And in those three and a half years, the world will turn over all their assets, their money, their government, their laws, their, their religions, everything over to the Antichrist because there is a loving relationship between the two based on deception. Do you think that's happening now today? Yes. Of course it is. That is happening now. When you go on a date, you go nice, right? Put some smoke good stuff. You actually work. You actually work. <laughs> you know, for you know, you actually look good for once. Guys, we actually comb our hair. We actually shave. We actually wear brute. We actually wash our clothes. Everything to make a good impression. First impression is the is the first impression is the most important impression. It's not. The first impression is the most deceiving impression. Because it's easy, it's easy to prepare yourself for something. But when the chips are down, when you really want to have a relationship, you have to go through the hard times with that person. That's when you know if you love someone. Now when it's all good, it's real easy when it's all good and they call you, they text you, they buy you gifts. 
uh, take it to the nice restaurants. That's easy. That's 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 easy. It's hard when you have no money and you're trying to make ends meet, or you have problems that you have to solve together and you can't avoid it. Sometimes you get on each other's nerve. Last nerve about ten nerves ago, and you're still going strong. That's that's relationship. That's reality. That's that's when you know you love someone. Not when it's good, but when it's tough. See, the Antichrist is going to come in, and he's going to deceive everyone. And once he gets a hold of them, he will never let them go. And, and they're going to love him so much that they will receive the mark on the number of his name, which is a death sentence. And when they do that, someone asked me, will, will there be more people in heaven or hell? My first answer is this. Forget about everyone else right now. What about you? Are you going to heaven or hell? Get yourself right first. Don't worry about anyone else. Don't, don't be nosy. Think about yourself first. Are you right with God? Once you determine that, then go outside. Worry about someone else. And my answer is, my answer is this. Why would Jesus say that the way to destruction is the broad way? And the way to heaven is through a narrow way. What was did, did he misinterpret anything, or was he telling us something? Why were there only eight people in the ark? If the world was being destroyed by flood, you'd think you'd get your lives right to get on that boat, right? But yet only eight people survived. Why? Eight people versus millions of people that were populating this earth at the time, and only eight survived, and the rest died. Those were a lot of people that died. And do you think they went to heaven? Heaven may be a great big place, but I don't think it's going to be that full. Because a lot of people think they're going to heaven based on what they do and what they know, based on the church they belong to rather than the one who died on the cross for their sins. They based everything on their works instead of their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it's going to be a very sobering day. Because you think a lot of people are going to be there, folks. They may not be. You think Jesus grades on the curve? You think Jesus lets you slide by because he's, he's grandfather? No. You re repent of your sins. You go to heaven. You repent of your sins. Get your life right with God. That means you follow God in everything. That means you submit to Him. If you don't, God is not like us. You know, sometimes as parents, we're like, oh, all right, I'll let you get by. You should have had my parents. <laughs> I'm sorry. You would have ran away from my parents when the first chance you got. You thought you were in prison. But they knew that if we endured tough love, when we got out, we wouldn't mess around. That's true, we haven't messed around. My brother and I, all we do is just follow God and we, we praise God and we, we try to help people. But the world out there does not want you to follow God. They want you to make mistakes. They want you to, they want to bring you down through everything and anything. And I'm telling you right now, I want you to be prepared because the devil is going to deceive the world like you have never seen before. This is the tribulation, three and a half years of deception. What is happening right now, the great deception is starting now. The devil is going to make, he's going to force your beliefs, he's going to force you to examine your beliefs, your philosophy, he's going to force you to examine your relationship with God. He wants you to question authority. He wants you to question what is right. He wants you to question what is true. He wants you to question God. He wants you to question the Bible. He wants you to question the Spirit. He wants you to question prophecy. He wants in your mind, he wants to put a little chink in your armor, the armor of God, and he wants to get in there and just cause disruption. He wants to put fear instead of faith. He wants to put disarray and despair instead of encouragement and hope. He wants to get in there and make life tough. He wants you to get in there and make life just a little uncomfortable for Christians. That's what he wants to do. Because he is in the business of making people doubt and fearful and weak and timid 
and not strong. He will, he's in the business of deceiving you and getting caught in traps where it's not good for you, where you will eventually, and the greatest trap in ever, ever invented, I'm telling you, was just a little piece of paper with glue on it. Have you ever noticed that? For rats? Rodents? Put glue and they get caught in it. That poor rat or mouse is there, can't get out, cannot get out, and it's stuck there until they either die or something happens to them. They try their best to get out, but they're stuck. And they try and try with all their might, and they're still stuck until they eventually die or they get killed. And that's, that's what the devil does with sin. He wants you to get you in a place where you're comfortable, get you caught. You become addicted. And then you start to question, well, if God loves me, he wouldn't have let me in the first place be caught in this. Have you ever heard of that philosophy? If God really loved me, he should have let me come in here and do this. Well, duh! See, that's where the devil gets you. If God loves, if God really wanted this world to be perfect, Adam and Eve would have, he would have stopped Adam and Eve from biting of that fruit. If God really loved the world, he would have never made it flood. Have you heard that? I heard the Pope say that. Yeah. If, if God would have loved us, there would never be a judgment, there would never be hell. If God truly loved us, he would love us. No, God is perfect and God is righteous and he is just. That is God too. Don't throw stuff out there. I'm just saying that's the truth. That's the truth. So in this three and a half years of dating, known as deception, in which the world will fall in love with the Antichrist, and I mean that seriously, that's not a joke, that's not fake. They will whore themselves to the Antichrist when they will accept his leadership and his mark. They become a whore. I don't know how else to put it. Can you think of a better way? That's what, they, that's what they do. They give of themselves. They give their life, their soul, their body to the Antichrist. I call that a whore, don't you? Those are your Fifty Shades of Grey. You want Fifty Shades of Grey? You got it, Bubba. What, last, what, three minutes? Four minutes? What after that? Jesus is forever. His love is forever. His love is perfect. His love is unconditional. His love is true. His love is real. His love is here. If you want to be loved, be loved by the perfect man. Be loved by the God man. Be loved by someone who really cares. Be loved by Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to get excited now? Be loved by Jesus Christ. He is here to love. He is here to save. He is here to conquer. He is here to bless. He is here to heal. Yeah. I cannot, you know what, I'm, I, ooh. I, I don't understand my pastor friends that don't take this seriously. I really don't. Seven-year tribulation. The hits keep on coming. Daniel, 2 Thessalonians, Matthew, and Revelation tell you of all that is going to happen in seven years. The three and a half years of deception, it will start, and then they will end in the Antichrist's reign. Then you have Armageddon. That will happen right before, I mean, the second coming of Jesus Christ. This will happen at the end of the Antichrist reign. Armageddon is the bloodiest war, period. It is the end of all wars. That's when Jesus comes back and the Antichrist and all his millions of deceived and lost people will fight against God. And it will end just like that. He will not be a fight. He will be like a Mike Tyson fight. Remember the Mike Tyson fight? Tell you pay 60 bucks to see Mike Tyson. It's in a, what, a, what, a minute, two minutes. Bing, and that's it. That was one of the worst sham jobs ever to pay for to see a Mike Tyson fight. You wasted, what, 75 bucks to get a front row seat? 
you go to the bathroom to fight so mm. that's what it'd be like all this build up that the inner Christ will deceive the world of the thinking we're finally going to defeat God and listen to this speech you ready for this you think the Pope's speech was bad I'm going to top it right here we're going to defeat God we're going to defeat the King of Kings and Lord of Lords we're going to defeat this Jesus that has made religion a uh, uh, made us prisoners under his rulership we will finally have our freedom. We will defeat heaven. We will defeat the angels. We will defeat this God that tells us all the time to fear him, to fear him. I've come to re free you from him. I've come to set you free and to live the life the way you want it, how you want it, when you want it. You are your own gods. You are your own destiny. Follow me as we fight him and defeat him. And then they go in once, two seconds later, it is over. And here's a warning for you. There will be more blood here than in any bloody horror movie that you see in Hollywood. There will be more blood here than any of the wars on this planet has ever known. What, why am I saying this? Because Jesus hates sin. Jesus hates the devil. Jesus hates the Antichrist. G, listen to this is for you, puppet. Jesus hates the false prophet. Okay? When Jesus hates, it's a perfect hatred. It's complete. He does not want to see you ever again. You are gone. He wants you out of the way. He will put you out of the way. All these sinners that are led, and they're like sheep to the slaughter, literally. This will be like goats to the slaughter. They, every one of you, will die. There are no prisoners of war here. This is not John McCain. You get in there, you will die. Jesus will make sure that you are an example of what happens when you rebel against him. We're going to be on the other side watching this. And you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be praising God because he's perfect, he's just. We will praise him more because he is the God of justice. We're going to look into that Armageddon and see how bad it really is. Then will come finally for Israel. Finally, they're going to be restored as a nation. Poor Israel, boy, they've been through a lot, haven't they? But they will finally have true peace when Christ reigns on this earth. He will reign from Jerusalem. The millennial king will last 1,000 years, that's 10 cycles. And then when that's done, then we have the great white throne judgment. Someone asked me, what is the saddest thing in all the Bible that you can remember? That was actually a question of my test when I got my degree. My, uh, my professor says, I want you to write down the one thing that is the saddest thing to you in the Bible. And you know what I answered? The great white throne judgment. Here's why it's so sad to me. Because these are people that had an opportunity, a chance, to repent of their sins and get right with God. And they wasted it. They rejected it. And this is what makes me sad to me personally because these people had the same opportunity that we did. Remember, I told you. You may make the choice, but eventually the choice will make you. Remember that saying? You may make a choice, but eventually that choice makes you. This choice doomed them. Because Jesus, I cannot think of anything more horrible to ever hear than when Jesus says, away from me. I never knew you. I went on, um, what was it, uh, my brother, he, he likes to research magazines and all these worldly publications. He answers questions from these magazines, actually. Very skin smart. There was this magazine that published, a Christian magazine, that published the happiest story and the saddest story of Christians. 
is happy stories when Jesus found him. And he puts this out of story and says, the same Jesus that says I found you and love you is the same Jesus that says I never knew you. And, and you think about that, and I want you to focus on this. We get distraught and we get depressed if we're not recognized and loved by certain people. Is that true? I've heard many couples that have been married, what, 20, 30 years, 40 years, they wake up one morning and the husband and the spouse says to another, I fell out of love with you, or I don't love you anymore. How devastating is that? Our best friends have been best friends for years, and then one day they say, I lost touch with you, I don't know who you are. We're going in different directions. That's one thing. But when Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, says to a person, away from me, I never knew you. I cannot imagine the feeling, or I cannot imagine how that person will feel. Jesus is the symbol of love, amen? He's the symbol of forgiveness and mercy. With Jesus, he loves us perfectly. He accepts us without condition. But when you tell someone, I don't know who you are. And then worse, depart from me. Get out of my sight. That's why this is the saddest moment right here. Because the same God that rejected is the same God that will send them to hell. And I want you all people to live, I want you all to listen very carefully. You live your life as though there is no hell. You live your life as that there is no judgment. You live your life as that there are no consequences. You think God is allowing you to do this, so that means He agrees with what you're doing. I have news for you. God doesn't agree with your sins, and He does not agree with what you're doing. You will pay for your sins. The circle will come full. What goes around comes around. It will come back to you in spades. It's going to be reality. Don't think you're getting away with sin. Don't think you're getting away with it. It's coming back to you. You need to repent of your sins and, reje and reject the devil and receive Jesus. You need to repent of your sins and turn and leave your sins. There is no sin worth dying for. There is nothing worth dying for and separating you from, love, from the love of Jesus. There is nothing more important than Jesus. There's nothing more important than God. There is nothing more important than heaven. You better get that through your thick heads out there. Your sin will destroy you. Your sin will enslave you. Your sin will finally destroy every fiber of your being. Unless you return to Jesus Christ. Unless you repent of your sins, get on your hands and knees and says, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, save me. That is what will save you. If your sin is that good, stay in it. Because you are against you. You know what? Stay in it. Stay in, in the deceitful pleasures of sin and see where that gets you. All right. Let's finish here. I'm going to... Okay, I got some time. Good. Um, let me go here to Revelation 14. See, to me, that's preaching. Is that preaching to you? Amen. <laughs> preaching is not Boudreaux jokes. Preaching is not having fun. This is, you go to a comedy club for that. But this is this is when it comes to your soul, you better be right. Because if you're not right with this, it will cost you forever. Um, on this second sheet here, that Josh should have. First thing is first, the scenes on the earth, and the first part, I think you all have this. If not, uh, let us know, we'll get your copy. There will be a test on this when we conclude Revelation because this is something that you all need to know. The scenes on the earth, the introduction in Revelation 1, the Christ and then the churches. This is Christ in the church age, which extends from chapters 2 and 3. Notice here, after the opening of the seven seal scroll will come the rapture, which is in chapter 4, verse 1. So the rapture, again, I want to point out, happens before the tribulation. Now, to those people that say out there, this is not a big deal, it is a big deal. Because when it comes to the Bible, you cannot take anything lightly. It's God's Word. The rapture will happen, then the seven-year tribulation will happen. Now, notice here in the seven-year tribulation, 
the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet ju judgments will happen. They will occur. The seven bowl judgments will happen after the trumpet judgments. They're going to go hand in hand. Now notice here in the last half, uh, in chapters 12, it says the vision of the sun clad woman, the vision of the 144,000 saints, and of the judgment day, which is in Revelation chapter 12. You go to Revelation chapter 15, is the vision of the sea of glass around the throne. That is the victory of those that were martyred for Jesus Christ. They will be martyred, but they will be with the Lord forever. The seven bold judgments will start in Revelation 16. These are the worst of the judgments. These are the worst plagues ever to hit. And that Christ will establish self-worship in Revelation 13. The false prophet and the mark of the beast. Okay. The Antichrist is a ruler. The mark of the beast, and beast has been symbolic of nations. If you notice in Daniel, it talked about the beast of the leopards and the, and the lions and so forth. The Antichrist will, will have everyone tattoo and, and chip their name on these people that receive the number of his name. That's the mark of the beast. The Babylonian government and commercial capitalism will be destroyed finally in Revelation 18. That means that the one world government, the one world economy, everything one world will be destroyed by then. Then will come the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. Satan is, bound, is uh, bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years in Revelation 20. You have the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. Satan will deceive the nations one last time in Revelation 20 when he's finally cast into the lake of fire. Now, a lot of people were saying, well, why, why was he thrown into the bottomless pit the first time for a thousand years and then Jesus reigned? Why is he let loose? It's to fulfill prophecy. God has allowed Satan one last time to deceive the nations. One last time. And notice what he does here. He's always deceiving the nations. He's a deceiver. That's who he is. The judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment, will happen in Revelation chapter 20. And then finally, will be the new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem. No more devil, no more sin, no more pain. No more tears, no more suffering, no more doubt, no more fear, no more fighting. It will finally be peaceful forever. Let's look here at Revelation chapter 14. I'm going to start here in, uh, we talked about last week, the second one. We talked in great detail what, what it does, how it's compared to the cluster of grapes with a sharp sickle. And how this angel will come across like this and let me read this carefully. Verse 14, And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sounded like the son of man having his head on a grown up crown and on his hand a sharp sickle. Now let me read that again. And now behold the white cloud, and upon one sat one that sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, saying, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the, on the cloud thrust in the sickle, and on the earth, and the earth was reaped. If you got your notes from last week, the Israelites had a sickle that had a blade at the end of a large stick and they would use that blade to harvest in their crops to cut away all the weeds and all the dead grass and bring in the fruit. That is the, that is the sickle that is being compared to here in the Bible. Because listen to what happens here in verse 18. And another angel came from the altar. Notice we came out of the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather in the clusters of the vine of the earth, and her grapes are fully ripe. That means that they're ready to be harvested. And the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Blood came out of the winepress, and even unto the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. 
Now, you're probably saying, what does that mean? This is a summary of the Battle of Armageddon. This will happen in the Valley of Megiddo. This will happen at the north end of the nation of Israel. The Battle of War began the Valley of Megiddo. This was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 63. He prophesied about this great battle. Let me read to you some of that here. Listen to this in Isaiah. Mm. Isaiah 63, verse 3. This is what Jesus said, and look at, look at verses 3 and 4, because they're, they're the summary of Armageddon. Isaiah prophesied this in 698 B.C., 698 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This was prophesied by Isaiah. He said, I have trodden the winepress alone, and the people there was none for me. For listen to this, I will tread with mine anger and trample them in my fury. This is what Jesus said. I will trample them in my anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. This is the detail of what is happening in this battle of Armageddon, which is finally when good triumphs over evil, finally. Listen to this in verse 4. Do you remember when the Lord said in the book of Romans that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? Do you remember that? He said in verse 4, For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my deep redeemed is come. Verse 5, And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold from my own arm brought salvation unto me in my fury did that upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. This is a very, very vivid description of Jesus. This is a very, very vivid description of what is going to happen in Revelation. When you look at all this and when it's all when it's all brought to face, these are details. Now I want you to look here in verse 3 again. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. That should give you an idea of how much blood there will be. How much blood there will be shed at this great battle known as Armageddon, prophesied by Isaiah at this time. And to give you, uh, to give you a vivid picture of this, I'm going to go to your show here and pretty much furlough. Yeah. A thousand and six hundred furlongs. A furlong is an eighth of a mile. In chapter in verses fourteen through twenty of this chapter, Revelation fourteen, verses fourteen through twenty, it is describing the sharp sickle and the harvest, the grapes of wrath. That is used to signify the blood. When you see grapes, and the cluster of grapes, and then the thrusting of it, this is describing in detail what is going to happen in the Battle of Armageddon. There's going to be a great thrust, a great force in this fight. A one-sided force, no, nonetheless. And then the grapes that are, that are put in through the vat, and that are crushed, and all the juice comes out, that is the blood that will come out of the people that dare go against Jesus Christ. Now here it says here, in verse 20, and the winepress was tried without the city, and blood came out of the winepress. This is where the symbolism takes full effect. The grapes that you that you saw in verses 14 through 20 is now called blood 
in this in this one verse. From verses 14 through 19, it talks about the grapes being trampled, right? In verse 20, it is now described as blood. The blood came out of the wine press, even into the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six furlongs. So each furlong is one eighth of a mile. The blood will cover in this valley of Megiddo. You want to know how long that is? When you put together 1,600 furlongs of space, this great battle and the blood that will rise to the horses' bridles, and you're probably going to say, oh, that's, that, you know, these are not small horses. Horses, on the average, can go anywhere from, from six, between six to eight feet. You're talking about 200 miles. In those 200 miles, when it says up to the horse's bridles, you're talking about blood that will be as deep as 7 to 8 feet high. Now, I'm 6'1". So if it were 8 feet high, the blood could probably come up, up to that, right to where the, the part of the cross is on this side probably halfway between there okay so if we are not on a high space we would drown in blood the blood will be that high all around for 200 miles now I want you to, to sit there for a second or for a short time and I want you to think in our minds 200 miles of seven to eight foot high blood. I don't think there's any war that will come close to that. Blood will shed, but not blood that is that high and that spacious. We're talking blood, human blood. Those lives lost because they were deceived and they followed the wrong person. It cost them their lives, it cost them eternity, because they were deceived and they followed the wrong person. Folks, here's, here's the message in all this. When you're talking about the Battle of Armageddon, you're talking about Jesus fighting this battle. We had great generals in our time, we had MacArthur, patent. Uh, you think of great great military leaders that have won many battles for this country. But were they perfect in their victories? No. They weren't perfect. Were they, uh, they did their best, but it wasn't perfect. We did not win Vietnam. Many people think we did. But what good really came from Vietnam? 9-11 happened and we've, we've, uh, our president said, we're going to go there and they're going to know we're coming. But did we really end terrorism? We were, we were eating at McDonald's, again, McDonald's. We were eating there, and in Kenya, in Nairobi, what, over 60 people were killed by these terrorists that took over the shopping mall. Blood was shed that day, but terrorism was not ended. Look what happened in the Navy shipyard. A former Navy reservist shooting and killing over 10 to 15 people. It's getting to the point now where you don't know if you're going to leave, when you walk out that door, if you're going to come home nowadays. Here's what we're saying. You're talking about millions and millions of people fighting against God in the battle of Armageddon. Blood as high as seven to eight feet high of blood, 200 miles around. These people lost their lives because they followed the Antichrist. These people lost their lives because they followed the false prophet. In other words, when you do not follow him, there is, there is, there is only destruction. If you don't follow Jesus, you will die. If you don't follow his way, you will be lost forever. Jesus, Jesus never deceives anybody. He is the way and the truth and the life. 
and he will never lie to you. He will never deceive you. He is straight up honest with you. And he won't he won't waste time in telling you that. He and he will tell you, like you told your revelation. I'm gonna tell you this. There'll be a great battle. But those that fight on the side of the Antichrist and the false prophet, you will die. And I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna end. Blood will be this high. And blood will be for this miles around. There is no one that is going to survive this. Not a single human being is going to survive this war. So when you take sides, you better make sure you choose properly. If you go against him, you will lose. If you rebel against him, you will lose. If you ignore him, you will lose. If you reject him, you will really lose. But if you follow the Antichrist, if you follow the world, if you follow all the pleasures and the allurements and the deceivements of it, this is what is going to happen at the end. That's reality. And there's more that we'll get into it in, in, in the next chapters. But let's look at chapter 15 in our notes. First thing you know, it's on page uh, 23. If you have it with you, we're going to go over this chart. Sevens and threes. Remember, in the in the very beginning of Revelation in chapter one, we talked about certain numbers that will pop out a lot. 7th is 1, 3 is another, 12 is another. Starting in Revelation chapter 6 all the way to 16, you will see the cycle of judgments. Revelation 6 through 8 is the seals. The seals will be opened one by one. Then you have the trumpets that the angels will come. Now remember, the angels are the messengers. When the angels come and blow the trumpets, that means that there will be a certain... Uh, punishment that will be dealt on the earth to the people. The worst ones are the bolts of wrath in Revelation 16. Revelation 16 is what is going to happen to this planet finally. This planet is pretty much going to be done after these bolts of wrath happen. This world, global warming, will look like a cakewalk to what happens after the bolts of wrath. But let's look at the bottom of verse 23. Then I saw another sign in Revelation 15 marks the beginning of a new vision. A prelude to the bold judgments to tell in Revelation 16. You learn two facts. Page 24. This needs to be very clear. First, the bold the bolds represent seven worldwide plagues. That's very important to understand. These are seven worldwide plagues that will happen during the Great Tribulation, towards the end of it. And it will affect every continent, every country, every island, everything on this planet is going to be affected by it. The world translated plague literally means, listen to this, when you're talking about a plague, you're talking about a blow, a wound. It's taken from the verb meaning to strike. These judgments are not long drawn out famines or epidemics. Oh, no, no. Each affliction will be swift and severe. Second, the seven bold judgments will be the last expression of God's wrath toward the earth. Then comes the Battle of Armageddon, which will be the ultimate climatic event in the great war between good and evil. When I was growing up, I always wanted the good guys to win. Because they were good, right? But, it, but in our lifetime, we have seen people actually embrace evil. We have been we have seen evil legitimized. Evil made tolerable, evil made acceptable. We make excuses for evil. We tolerate it and say evil is a part of our life. Here's my question to you. If evil is so much a part of our life, 
then why is God having this great battle to finally end evil? When I asked this person one day what heaven will be like, you know what he told me? Heaven will be like the United States of America. <laughs> stop. Stop repeating. Okay. It will be like the good old U.S. of A. I said, really? How? Well, I, I think God will let everyone in. And I, I think that God is so full of love that he will overlook everything. I said, really? You know what our problem is? We make God like us instead of us becoming more Christ-like. We make God like us. We make him like he's sitting in this chair. Oh, I'm sorry. He's sitting in this chair. Hey, God. Can I, can I have $50? Oh, hey, God. Um, I'm going to go do something. Can you look the other way while I do it? You won't get mad at me while I do it, will you? You're God. You love, you're so full of love and mercy. It's all right. I could do that, right? I mean, you're not going to strike me down. You're God. You will never strike me down. No, 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 no. You will not hurt me. You're God. Or God... I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you what's going on. This person made me do it, so get mad at him, not me. I, I'm just a, I'm just a victim of this. You know, all these people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton says I'm a victim. So I must be a victim of what happened, and I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, God can... What do you think I was say? You can put your feet down, sorry. Well, is that how we treat God? We make God accept our rules. We make God accept our principles. We make God accept our philosophies, right? God has to change for us. God has to meet us on our terms. God has to accept abortion. God has to accept homosexuality. God has to accept one world religion. God has to accept the one world government. God is out of touch. He's up there. We're down here living real life. Really? This is real life? This is not real, folks. This is fantasy. This is deception. The devil has deceived us into believing this is reality. There will be no social media in heaven. There will be no Vegas in heaven. There will be no resorts in heaven. There's not going to be nothing in heaven like this. We're not going to miss a single thing from this planet when we get to heaven. Amen? We're not going to miss the misery, the pain, the taxes, everything else, the fighting. We're not going to miss a single thing from this planet when we get to heaven. We're not going to miss the disease. We're not going to miss Obamacare. We're not going to miss anything from this planet. We're not going to miss, miss all of these, these cults. We're, name one thing we're going to miss from this planet when we get to heaven. Name one thing when we get to heaven, we're going to look back and go, Oh, I sure missed, um, I don't know. What do you miss from heaven? You know the Christian that scares me the most? Christian that wants to be here instead of up there. That's the one that scares me. The Christian that loves this place more than heaven instead of Christian that I don't know they're Christian. They're, that's the thing. They fool themselves and they fool others but they don't fool him. God's going to say you, you call yourself what you want. I know who you are. The Christian that misses this more than heaven is the one that scares me. The one that tells me, Pastor I don't like this place. I want to go home. I know they're Christian. Pastor, I won't miss a single thing from this planet when I go home. That's a Christian. Pastor, I want, I'm want. i tired. I want to live for Jesus. I want to love my Lord in perfection and holiness forever and ever. That's a Christian. The battle of Armageddon will be the ultimate and final war between good and evil. And it will be war that will be so one-sided it's not funny. It's a war in which Jesus will finally make things right. Now, let me go back here to verse 24. In Revelation verses 15, chapters 15, verses 3 and 4, we see the Song of Moses being sung by the Lamb and provided a set of lyrics. Commentators offer separate theories for the identity of the songs. Most agree that the Song of Moses refers to one of two Old Testament passages. First, in Exodus 15, 1 through 18, in which Moses composed after the Lord's victory over the Egyptians at the Red Sea which is also a type of victory. It's a type of rapture because the Israelites went through the, they, after they parted the Red Sea, they were safe. They did not suffer the wrath of the Egyptians which were killed in the Red Sea, which God caused, which is a type of when the Antichrist 
and the false prophet will be gone. Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 43 was a song composed by the Israelites as they were about to enter the Promised Land. Both of these would have been very familiar to New Testament believers. We, we will know these songs when we get to heaven. The song of the Lamb, however, appears to be either new or unfamiliar. So John supplied the lyrics, both praises God for his attributes. Here's why. For who he is, his ways, and what he has done. The song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb is sung at the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was the song of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is the song of triumph over Babylon. Amen. The song of Moses told how God brought his people out. The song of the Lamb tells how God brings his people in. The song of Moses was the first song in scripture. The song of the Lamb is the last one. The song of Moses commemorated the execution of the foe of the enemy the expectation of the saints and the exaltation of the Lord. The Song of the Lamb deals with the same three things. The Song of Moses was sung by people, a redeemed people. The Song of the Lamb will be sung, listen to this, by a raptured people. Just as important as the words of people are singing is the fact that they are singing. This is celebration. During the Great Tribulation, multitudes will come to know Christ as Savior. Praise God. They will resist the Antichrist, and they will die for their faith. Here's what they will overcome. You ready for this? They will overcome the beast and related political pressure to reject Christ. Oh, by the way, that's happening now. The false prophet and over religious pressure to reject Christ. A bold statement was made this week to reject Christ. The number of the beast and the fierce economic pressure to reach in Christ. Revelation 13. Then on the eve of their tremendous judgment, the tribulation saints will gather for worship and thanksgiving. It will be a song of praise to replace their previous anguished cries for justice. And here's the victory I want to go over with you. And we'll start here. We'll, we won't finish it tonight, but we'll start here. Revelation 15 is a chapter of victory and glorification to our Lord. It also includes the seven plagues, the bowls that are God's wrath for the earth, the handwritten us of the dead. In verse 2, we see a great scene. It is one of the greatest scenes of the Bible. It is one of the greatest scenes that we will see in heaven. What is that scene? When the great tribulation saints <clears throat> are singing unto God for the victory over the Antichrist. Victory is only guaranteed in Christ. If you want to have victory in this life, it will only be in Jesus Christ. There is no victory outside of Christ. You cannot win apart from Jesus Christ. These saints were victorious because God blessed these saints with the strength and the discipline and the focus to focus on Him during the worst time in human history. When the devil will actually sit on the throne himself and finally get his wish to have his way with the world one last time. These people rejected the Antichrist, they resisted Him, and they said no to him. And they paid the ultimate price, which was their life. But really think about it in seriousness. What they gave up was far less than what they gained. So here's my question to y'all. Can you name one thing right now that is more precious and more valuable than Jesus Christ? Yeah. Now you might say no. Well, I'm going to dig a little deeper. I'm going to be a Columbo here. I'm going to ask one more question. I love Columbo. Awesome. Awesome. She gave the appearance of being nobody, right? <laughs> you looked at her and says, oh, get this guy out of the way. Smart man. Love this car. Awesome car. It's one thing to say 
that there's nothing more valuable and precious than Jesus. But it's another thing to actually show it. Do you remember when Jesus went to the rich young ruler? This person was rich. Filthy rich. Upper 1% of our economy, as they would say today. And Jesus says, I will give you more than you ever have had in your life if you give all that you have to the poor and the homeless. Follow me and you will have everything. Now a lot of people, a lot of preachers will say well, he, that he was talking about wealth and money. No, he wasn't. Jesus said, sell all that you have. So if someone were to come to you today and tell you, if you well not, let me rephrase that, if God were to tell you today, I want you to give up your job. I want you to give up your business. I want you to give up everything you own. I want you to give up your friends. I want you to give up everything that you have and know. I want you to give up your family. Follow me. And you will have all that you need for the rest of your life. Let me repeat that again. Give up everything that you own, that you have. Give up your family, your friends, your job, everything that you have. Follow him. How many of you think people would accept that and do it? Abraham did. Amen. God told him, take take everything that I mean, turn your back on everything you've known, and I'm going to show you a better place called the promised land. Noah, this is going to go away. Build this ark. Let people know because this is going to go away very soon. He did it. He told his 12 chosen people, he said to Peter and to John and to Matthew and to Luke and Bartholomew and Thaddeus, I have chosen you to follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I want you to leave your jobs, your business, your families, your friends, your way of life that you know, and follow me. They took it. Would you do it? How long would it take for you to do it? Would you do it quick? Or would you have to think? Now here's the part that gets me. Would you have to think about it? I gotta think about that one, Pastor. Hold on. <clears throat> You're asking him to wait? You're asking him to wait? Bubba, listen. You're asking him to wait. We better not make the neighbor wait. We better not make mama wait. We better not make our BFF wait. We better not make whosoever wait. We'll make him wait. Hold on, we'll get back to you in that one. You're asking a lot. We're asking him to wait, are we? Think about that. Let, let it seep in. Lord, I will do it. Or Lord, wait. I gotta look back. Ask Lot's wife about looking back and see what happened to her. Ask, ask her when, well, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if she made it to heaven. I don't know. That's a good question. When you disobey God's command, that's pretty much a sign. Mm, I don't think so. But when you ask Lot's wife, and she looked back, what did she do? Turn to a pillar of salt. And it blew away. But here's the devil. I will give you whatever you want. I will give you all the friends you want. I will give you all the money you want. I will give you all the pleasures you want. I will give you peace. I will give you whatever you want. Follow me. I will, you want food? Accept my mark in your right hand or on your forehead, and you will have the time of your life. You want to party? You want to live as there's no heaven? Follow me. If you want to live as there's no judgment, follow me. If you want to have any God in the street, if you're so desperate for a man or woman for a guy, let me tell you something. I could get you that person right now. Just follow me. Do it my way and you will have it your way. This is not Burger King here. You will have it your way. 
You know how many people will take that deal in a heartbeat? I could tell you millions of people that took that deal. And you know where they are? The dead. I could tell you millions of people that have took that deal with the devil. And I could tell you where they are. They're fish fry right now. If you want to have victory, in your life, if you better have it in Jesus, because there's no other victory. Let me share one thing with you before before we pray. Next week is going to be a very hard week for me personally. It's going to be a very hard week toward the end of the week. I want to talk to the young people real quick. Young people, you're being attacked by the devil. You don't even know it. If you have good parents that are in Jesus, that go to church and believe in God and live like it and are saved and are redeemed people, good people, you better listen to them. Don't doubt them, don't dispute them, don't ignore them. Because one day they won't be there. And everything they've told you, you better memorize it and put it in your heart because one day they will not be there. They'll be gone. If you want to have a life, you need to have it in Jesus Christ. That's your life. Because if you have it in anyone else, it will fail. If you want your future to be blessed, only God can bless it. No one else can. Make choices as though you have a life. Don't make choices as though you're going to waste it. Make choices as though you're going to live it for yourself, for your future family, friends, but mostly to God. Choose Jesus now. Don't wait till you're older. Don't wait till you're 20. Don't. Wait. This is not an old people thing. I've heard that many times. That's an old people thing to accept Jesus. No, I accept Jesus right now. Because those people in Connecticut, those kids, they didn't have a chance. They were shot when they were dead and young. Those people in Washington, they were shot dead before they had another sh chance to say Jesus. Pick Jesus now. Choose him today. Today is the day of salvation. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed the next hour. Something could happen. Choose Jesus now. Surrender your life to Him. Repent of your sins and accept Him right now. Because if you don't, there is nothing but depression, destruction, and deceitment waiting for you. The devil will throw anyone, any pretty thing, any lovely thing, any sweet thing, any hard thing, anything to deceive you and to trap you. Um, my dad's birthday is next Monday. And the one thing I'm going to tell him is thank you. And so I'm going to tell them. Yes, thank you. Just remember those things. We don't have many, we don't have much time left. And the good people are going away. So we need to get it right right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are our Heavenly Father. You are our God. Your Son is our King, our Lord and Savior. And 
Heavenly Father, we need you. First, we thank you for all that you do for us and have done. We thank you for giving us of your Son who died on the cross for our sins. Who did it out of his love toward us. Lord, we thank you for your word that you preserved for us to study this evening, your eternal word. The word that tells us of your plan and your will and your ways. We thank you for your spirit that's in our hearts and our minds. Heavenly Father, you love us so much. You gave, you give, and continue to give. Lord, what we ask of you, humbly ask of you, Lord, is to please bless us and to strengthen us during this time. We pray for our younger generation, our young people, that are being attacked by the devil. Some of these kids don't have good families, they don't have good homes, they're lost, they fall into gangs, they follow the wrong crowd. They're independent, they have to survive on their own. Lord, I pray for our younger generation. I pray that you will send the people in their life that really care about them and their soul mostly, and their life. I pray that you will lead them to Jesus as the only way of life, as the only way of salvation. Heavenly Father, there, there are people in our families right now that are lost. They think everything's fine, they think everything's hunky-dory, they're going on the road of destruction, don't even know it. So Heavenly Father, I pray for those people, we pray for those people in our families that are lost. We pray for them, Lord, that you, they will hear the message, send someone that will get in their mind and their heart and their soul that Jesus is the only way of salvation, that they need to repent of their sins and turn to you, Lord, for salvation, and to submit to your will and authority. Heavenly Father, I do pray for this church. This is your church. This is your church, Lord. And I know deep in my heart that every single one of these people will be raptured. It will come a Sunday. There will be time for service but our service will be up there. And there will be no one here. But oh Lord, if for some reason that there is someone left behind, may we have the message to tell them to keep going forward, and that they still choose you. They may give up their life, but they will be eternally yours once they receive you and choose you over him. And Heavenly Father, we also pray for, for our health, pray for Joe's health, Good man, Lord. Bless him. Help him to be strong. Pray for Carrie and his health and his family. Pray for the, the ladies of this church. Without their prayers, I don't think it would be possible, Lord. Um, pray for Christine. Um, pray for her first son, mostly, Lord. Jordan. Shake him up. Knock him off his horse like you did Paul. Like you did Saul. And that's what I ask out of you, Lord. He may get hurt, he may have abrasions, he may feel uncomfortable for a while, but if that's what it takes for him to get right with you, so be it. Uh, pray for Rachel and her family. Pray for Lynn. Lord, pray for Peaches, who lost her brother Leonard recently. Another tragic loss in her family. Pray for her strength. Just forgive us for all of our sins, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for all that you do. And Lord, we will focus on you. Please lead us and guide us. Christ's name.